today we go to ganita and chanda shastra and for ganita we have like we have seen for all domain sources and texts schools and thinkers and then the cogent statement of knowledge and ideas and applications and way forward are you with me yes so sources and texts schools and thinkers in ganita will be taken up by dr aditya Kul kulachna ji from indian institute of technology madras <clears throat> he is an assistant professor in the department of humanities and social sciences iit madras his research focuses on the history of science particularly the origins and development of mathematics and astronomy in india he is the principal investigator at the center for indian knowledge systems they have an indian knowledge system center at iit madras also the way we have it at iit kharagpur which aims to conduct quality research into the history of science in india he is a recipient of the young historian of science award bestowed by the indian national science academy so over to you dr aditya to take us through sources and texts schools and thinkers in indian mathematics one more time a big round of applause thank you thank you good morning everyone uh, it's a pleasure to be here to deliver a talk on a topic of my passion which is the history of mathematics in india and i hope that uh, this will go to some extent in uh, familiarizing everyone with the uh, the quite quite an extensive uh, history in the study and uh, development of mathematics in india and i hope that going forward you will be able to take some of these ideas some of these uh, facts to your respective institutes and spread it further okay so i will be talking about the sources texts scholars and thinkers in ganita i will give a brief history of what are the who are the major mathematicians what were the major schools and lineages and then in the latter part of the talk i will discuss some specific topics in mathematics and how they were dealt with by some of the thinkers in the indian mathematical tradition when i start i would just like to put a disclaimer that we only have one and a half hours and this is a vast topic even in a full fledged 40 hour uh, uh, course which is offered at iit madras we are only able to touch upon a few topics so one and a half hours is does no justice actually uh, to this history so just keep that in mind that we are only very briefly touching upon some highlights in this talk so if i were to provide a brief historical overview summarize the the entire history and development of mathematics in india over the past few millennia the earliest sources as in as with many other topics the earliest traces of uh, mathematics in india the study of mathematics in india can be traced to the vedic literature the vedic lit literature uh, lists various sequences uh, we find a notion of infinity in the vedic literature the concept of infinity so some of these topics uh, i'll briefly Uh, you know we will see what some of these uh, sequences are in, in in later slides then we have uh, along with the vedic literature we have the vedanga lit literature so the shulbha sutras and the vedanga jyotisha uh, also have contain uh, certain mathematical concepts so the shulbha sutras are manuals for alter constructions and they have uh, various uh, rules of geometry which are found and they also deal with thirds again we will briefly look at uh, a couple of the concepts from the shulbha sutras the vedanga jyotisha is of course 
perhaps the first text of uh, astronomy in India. Uh, it refers to its uh, Jyotisha is referred to as the science of time determination in this text. And obviously, where, where there is astronomy, uh, you need a fair bit of mathematics. We may not get too much into this text in this talk. Following this uh, Vedas and Vedangas, we also have, uh, uh, interestingly, we find a number of mathematical concepts in non-mathematical texts such as Panini's Ashtadhyayi, Pingala's Chandas Sutra. We also find uh, certain uh, rules for combinations, etc. in uh, Ayurvedic texts like Charaka Samhita. The Jains, the Jains had their own tradition and they also uh, uh, had texts on mathematics, astronomy. For instance, there is a 5th century BC text called uh, Surya Pragnyapti, perhaps 3rd century BC. I, I just need to check that. Uh, subsequently, as we come to the first millennia, I think everyone knows Aryabhata. And Aryabhata, Varahamira, Brahmagupta, Bhaskara 1, Lalla, Mahavira, Shridhara, Shripati, Bhaskara 2. These are uh, some of the major figures who have written very important texts on both mathematics and astronomy. Astronomy keeps coming up. Though the topic is Ganita, I keep referring to astronomy because in the initial stages in India, a lot of the mathematics was developed in service of astronomy. So, in fact, we find that the majority of the mathematicians in India also tend to be astronomers. And that, therefore, we have that Aryabhata, Varahamira, almost all the names listed here are also astronomers. Subsequently, the development of mathematics continued. We have uh, the two important figures, Thakkura Heru and Narayana Pandita. Thakkura Heru is an important figure in the development of magic squares in India. And uh, Narayana Pandita has written a fairly large mathematical text called Ganita Kaumudi, which discusses various things including cyclic quadrilaterals and also has an entire chapter dedicated to magic squares. Unfortunately, you will not have time today to get deeply into this magic squares. It's very, very interesting. Some of you might have, when you were young, you might have uh, dealt with these kinds of problems where you have to fill numbers in a square, in the cells of a square, such that the rows, columns and diagonals add up to a given number. So it's, it's a very interesting topic and it has been dealt with very systematically by Narayana Pandita. Uh, in this uh, same time period, what is known as the Kerala school also flourished, the Kerala school of mathematics and astronomy. Generally, Madhava is credited as the founder of the school and he lit a spark which seems to have inspired the successive generation, generations of scholars to contribute to mathematics and astronomy. So, Parameshwara, Nilakantha, etc. Uh, we will look at uh, the school in little bit more detail later on in the talk. In the same period, we also have other important uh, mathematicians and astronomers such as Ganesha Devagnya, Munishwara. So they all also belong, belong to certain lineages which we will see later. Coming to more recent times, perhaps the last major uh, Sanskrit work in math, uh, a mathematical work is the Siddhanta Darpana of Chandrasekhar Samantha. It is mainly an astronomical text which brings in many new ideas and innovations. Uh, Chandrasekhar Samantha was a scholar from uh, Orissa. And uh, in the 20th century, there have been commentaries by scholars such as Sudhakar Dvivedi and others. So the Sanskrit, the, the this tradition the, the Indic tradition of mathematics has continued in the form of commentaries in the 20th century. So this is the kind of a summary of the, uh, the history and development of mathematics in India. And here I list some of the important texts and their authors. And uh, 
uh, their time periods. So we mentioned that the Vedanga Jyotisha is perhaps the first uh, text on astronomy in India, dedicated to astronomy. It's generally attributed to one Lagadha. And scholars have dated it to about uh, 14th to 12th century BC based on certain astronomical data available in the text. I had mentioned about the Shulba Sutras. The Shulba Sutras are also a Vedanga text. They belong to the uh, Kalpa. And uh, there are various uh, versions of the Shulba Sutra texts. There is the Bodhayana Shulba Sutra, there is the Apastamba Shulba Sutra, Katyayana Shulba Sutra. Uh, some scholars, based on some uh, linguistic uh, and uh, other ca characteristics, date the Bodhayana Shulba Sutra to perhaps 800 or 1000 BC. Uh, though it is, I would not say it's very conclusive. We then, of course, have Aryabhata and uh, his main major text, Aryabhatiya, which is a 5th century text, 5th century CE. Vara Mehra has written the Pancha Siddhantika, uh, an important astronomical text. Aryabhatiya of Aryabhata is all, we will again discuss this in a little bit more detail later. It is again a, mainly a text on astronomy, but one chapter is dedicated to mathematics. Pancha Siddhantika of Vara Mehra is mainly a text on astronomy. Bhaskara 1 has written an important commentary on Aryabhatiya, which is known as Aryabhatiya Bhashya. This is a 7th century work which actually greatly helps us to interpret and understand the Aryabhatiya in more detail because the Aryabhatiya is a somewhat terse text. And it is in this text that uh, Bhaskara 1 has explained the rationales and the rules and the rationales in greater detail. Brahma Gupta has written the Brahma Sputta Siddhanta. Brahma Sputta Siddhanta, again, it majorly a text on astronomy, but uh, it contains uh, chapters uh, on dedicated to mathematics, uh, such as Ganita Adhyaya, Puttaka Adhyaya. Puttaka Adhyaya is dealing with uh, Puttaka is the kind of problems dealing with first order indeterminate equations. Brahma Gupta also deals with the second order indeterminate equations. Again, unfortunately, we will not have time to get into all this in this talk. Lalla has written an interesting text called Shushya Ji Vridhida Tantra. The name itself is very interesting. Uh, Shishya Ji Vridhida Tantra. So, Shishya is, of course, the student. Shishya Ji Vridhida Tantra means uh, the treatise which will enhance the intellect of the student. Dhi is buddhi. So, Shishya Ji Vridhida Tantra. So that which enhances the intellect of the student. Uh, this is an important astronomical text. Uh, for, this is perhaps the first text where an attempt has been made to determine the surface area of a sphere. So there is some error in it. Subsequently, Bhaskara 2 actually gives the correct computation of the surface area of a sphere as well as the derivation, the proof for it in his Siddhanta Shiromani in the 12th century. But uh, Lalla is the, made the first uh, sort of attempt in this uh, in this text. Uh, slowly, now we start. Uh, uh, till now, mathematics was uh, intermingled with astronomy. Around this time period, uh, for instance, in Sridhara's Trishatika and later on Mahaviracharya's Ganita Sara Sankaha. We find that mathematics has uh, started to be treated alone. So it's just, uh, you know, on its own. It's not no longer, you know, a part of the text on astronomy. There are no dedicated works to mathematics, and uh, mathematics is treated, treated as a subject in its own right. Uh, so I'll skip a little bit and I'll come to Bhaskara II. Bhaskara II is, a, of course, a very major figure. He has written works such as Leelavati, Bija Ganita. Siddhanta Shiromani. He has also written uh, another astronomical treatise called Karana Kutuhala. Leelavati and Bija Ganita are texts. So, Leelavati, uh, these are texts purely dedicated to mathematics. So, Leelavati is a text on uh, arithmetic and geometry, and Bija Ganita is a text dedicated to algebra. Uh, these, these proved to be highly popular and uh, uh, with the dozens of commentaries in Sanskrit, particularly the Leelavati, 
there are dozens of commentaries in sanskrit and it has also been quite extensively translated into various uh, uh, indian languages and uh, there are even foreign translations of the leelavati let me just go back a little bit i should have perhaps mentioned this when i was talking about brahma gupta this brahma sputa siddhanta of brahma gupta appears to be the first text which have been translated and gone out of india translated into arabic and gone out of india and it is this text which is perhaps uh, led to the spread of the uh, decimal place value system which was in vogue, vogue in india and kind of uh, led to the spread of many concepts used uh, uh, indian concepts of mathematics or rather concepts of mathematics developed in india to spread outside india similarly leelavati of bhaskara 2 also has been translated and uh, spread out out of india and bija ganita has discussed uh, various concepts of algebra siddhanta shiromani is an important text on astronomy but it is here in the context of determining the surface area of the earth that bhaskara 2 actually gives the correct relation for the surface area of a sphere and explains its derivation subsequently we have the ganita kaumadi of narayana pandita as i mentioned earlier this is an important text which deals with various concepts including cyclic quadrilaterals brahma gupta has of course also dealt with cyclic quadrilaterals and he has even given the formula for the diagonal of a cyclic quadrilateral but narayana discuss it in discuss this this in a topic in greater detail and he also has one chapter dedicated to the uh, mathematics associated with magic squares subsequently uh, there is an important uh, uh, astronomical text called tantra sangraha and then there is a commentary explaining the rationale of that called ganita yukti bhasha by jesh deva in the 16th century this ganita yukti bhasha is a very very important text as you can uh, perhaps guess from the name itself it is a, it's a text which gives mathematical rationales so there are various algorithms and uh, mathematical results employed in the tantra sangraha and jeshta deva gives the rationale for many of these concepts uh, many of these relations uh, in the ganita yukti bhasha including a very interesting derivation for the infinite series of pi which is generally attributed to madhava actually madhava is a name which is missing in this list this is let me just point out that uh, this is by no means a exhaustive list uh, madhava of course is the uh, attributed with very very many important uh, mathematical results and uh, we will briefly look at madhava little while later munishwara has also uh, munishwara is again another important figure who has written number of works he has written a text called siddhanta sarvabhauma which is a Uh, commentary on uh, sorry it's his, it's his own original uh, astronomical treatise he has written a co- commentary on the siddhanta shiromani of bhaskara 2 which he calls the marichi vyakya and he has also written a very uh, interesting commentary important commentary on the leelavati of bhaskara which he calls misrushta artha ruti there are some very interesting proofs in munishwara's uh, commentary on the leelavati which if we have time we will look in the stock finally as i mentioned perhaps one of the last major works in uh, mathematical texts uh, uh, produced in india is the siddhanta darpana of chandrashekhar samanta in orissa in the 19th century so what was the status of astronomy and mathematics in india so this verse from the vedanga jyotisha so as i mentioned vedanga jyotisha is one of the earliest works on astronomy produced in india so right there the exalted status of mathematics and astronomy in the indian tradition is stated uh, right away yatha shikha mayuranam nadanam manayo yatha tadvad vedanga shastranam jyotisham murdhanisthitam so yatha shikha mayuranam mayura i think most of you know we still use the term today is a peacock yatha shikha mayuranam so just like the po- poems of the peacock nadanam manayo yatha and like the crest jewels of the serpents tadvad vedanga shastranam jyotisham murdhanisthitam so 
there are six vedangas among those jyotisha stands at the topmost okay there is another uh, version of this verse which goes ganitam murdhanisthitam vedanga shastranam ganitam murdhanisthitam so this you can straight away see that mathematics astronomy are considered to be very important texts and are uh, you know uh, they have a very exalted position in the indian tradition we also get a sense of the impetus the motivation for the study of mathematics and astronomy in another verse from the vedanga jyotisha so vedahi yagnyartham abhipravrittaha kalanupurvya vihitaascha yagnyah tasmadidam kala vidhana shastram yojyotisham veda saveda yagnyam yagnyan there are different readings so the vedas have been revealed for the yagna for the purpose of performing yagna vedahi yagnyartham abhipravrutta kalanupurvya vihitaascha so but this yagnas cannot be performed at you know you cannot do them at as you wish at random periods of time they have to be performed at specified times according to sequences of time tasmadidam kala vidhana shastram so jyotisha has been defined as kala vidhana shastram okay so uh, it's a science of time determination yog jyotisham veda saveda yagnyan and so only one who knows astronomy the science which is the science of time uh, understands you know only they can perform this yagnyas appropriately so that seems to have been the initial impetus for the study of astronomy and of course there can be no study of astronomy without the study of mathematics so uh, there was a very high purpose which drove the study of the these two disciplines mathematics and astronomy this is just to give you a small clue on uh, what would a typical mathematical text look like so for instance these are the contents of the leelavati which is perhaps the most famous mathematical text uh, textbook of mathematics produced in india most texts generally start with what is known as paribhasha okay paribhasha is nothing but terminology where they define uh, various uh, terms which will be employed in the text so that uh, the student So the reader is not at a loss when they come across some technical terms. So, instance, for instance, in the Lila Vati, the Paribhasha deals with uh, units of currency, units of length, units of weight, uh, etc. So, be, because this will all be required in the in the various mathematical problems which will be dealt with later in the Lila Vati. the second chapter is called parikarmashtakam which is you know eight types of operations so these eight operations will be addition subtraction multiplication division square square roots cubes cube roots so generally nowadays i think in school uh, these topics are uh, not dealt with particularly square square roots cube cube roots are uh, gen- generally not dealt with in the primary grades but uh, here right at the beginning you start after addition subtraction multiplication division you start with square square roots and cubes cube roots interestingly the very first verse the very first verse would be the definition of the place values eka shata dasha eka eka dasha shata sahasra so on it goes they list powers of 10 leelavati powers of 10 until 10 power 17 are listed we will actually see that the powers of 10 are found in the vedic literature itself but they start with the place value then they deal with this eight operations then there are various rules in the next chapter you have rules of proportions quadratic equations etc then you can see mishra vyavahara you have calculation of interest purity of gold various mishra wherever there is some mixture involved so interest uh, you know you have the principal and interest so the final amount is a mixture of the principal and interest and then where you when you mix gold of various purity is what would be the purity of the resulting gold 
So various kinds of problems which involve mixtures are dealt with in Mishra Vyavahara. Shredhi Vyavahara deals with series, arithmetic series and uh, progressions. Kshetra Vyavahara, as you can guess from the name, Kshetra is a field. So it deals with geometry and uh, triangles, quadrangles, circles, etc. Khata Vyavahara, uh, generally it, it deals with excavations. So excavations can be in various shapes. It, it appears that the study of volumes was done in the context of excavations. So this particular chapter deals with the volumes of different shapes. Chiti Vyavahara uh, involves constructing altars. So just like the Shulga Sutras, the Chiti Vyavahara deals with some problems involved in constructing altars of various shapes and using bricks of different uh, sizes. Again, an interesting problem in geometry. Krakacha Vyavahara involves problems involved in sawing and carpentry. So, suppose someone is cutting a piece of wood. So, there will be different types of wood will be of uh, different hardness, different shapes. So, how do you determine, you know, for instance, what should be the wages involved uh, in, this, in this work? So, it will depend on the hardness of the wood and the cross-section of the wood which has been cut. So, there are some interesting problems. This has been even dealt with by Brahma Gupta earlier in Brahma Skuta Siddhanta. And Bhaskara also deals with this topic here. Then you have what is called as Rashi Vyavahara. So, Rashi Vyavahara, it deals with heaps. Okay. So, a problem in the olden times seems to have been... so. Uh, no, there were no large weighing scales and things like that. So, for instance, if a farmer has produced some grain, how does the farmer determine how much to charge, right? You don't know. Today we would weigh it and uh, rice would be, for instance, would be sold by weight. But in those days, perhaps there was no easy means of measuring large quantities of rice which has been harvested. So, these, are, these deal with some interesting approximations and uh, techniques of quickly estimating what would be the quantity of grain which has been produced depending on. So, we all know in villages even today we see that grain is stored in heaps. So, a means of quickly estimating the volumes of the heaps uh, perhaps as a way of uh, enabling uh, the farmer to determine what should, at what rate he should for how much he should sell uh, the produce. I would just like to point out that many of these topics here, Kata Vyavahara, Chitti Vyavahara, Krakacha Vyavahara, Rashi Vyavahara, you can see that these topics deal with, this is not abstract mathematics. Okay? These are real life problems in different professions, different aspects of community and society you know, mathematical problems faced, which have to be solved uh, in different sections of the society. So, it's, it's clearly indicative that this is not a text meant only for some elite class or for any one particular caste or community. Okay, you can clearly see that this is meant for various sections of the society. Generally, there is some criticism of some, uh, 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 some of these texts that uh, they are elite, you know, Sanskrit texts were elite texts and only a particular caste or community would do it. But you can see that clearly it is, it is targeted at various sections of the society. Chaya Vyavara is dealing with the shadows, basically problems in similar triangles. So you have a lamp and you have a, you know, you have a post on which there is a lamp and then there is a shadow. I think we have dealt with some of these kinds of problems in school even today. Nowadays, we deal with these kinds of problems. So, Chaya Vyavara deals with such problems. Kuttaka Vyavara is a very, very interesting topic. It is basically uh, solving first order indeterminate equations of the type Ax plus minus C equals By. So, you can see there is a single equation and X and Y, two variables are there. So, getting any solution, obviously there will be infinite solutions. Uh, a trivial solution would be to assume some value for x and determine a value for y. But the constraint put here is to 
obtain integral solutions to the problem okay once you put that constraint that you need an integral solution then the problem becomes quite challenging and uh, this this type of problems have been first dealt by aryabhata himself uh, brahmagupta has also dealt but uh, bhaskara uh, bhaskara too in the leelavati actually gives uh, very detailed algorithms which remove uh, which you know leave no scope for any confusion and uh, various scenarios are considered and uh, uh, it's a, it's a very very interesting discussion in the leelavati the final topic for in, in the leelavati would be what is known as anka pasha anka pasha anka is numbers so anka pasha is some you know some trap of numbers or something like that this is a very interesting problems involving permutations if you are given a set of digits you know how many numbers can you uh, how many different numbers can you form with that set of digits and what would be their sum that kind of a problem very very interesting it uh, may not have any straight of practical application but it also kind of shows that uh, this is mathematics for its own sake for the joy of mathematics for the pleasure of playing with numbers we see that over a period of time we see that uh, mathematics is slowly moving from its very very practical origins you know constructing altars computing astronomical problems to just the joy of mathematics in fact we find that even in madhava uh, the way he deals with uh, various problems it is just pure uh, you know uh, mathematics for its own sake i'll also so this was a pure mathematical text okay by the 11th by the 12th century this is what bhaskara had done in the leelavati if we step back a little bit to aryabhata in the 5th century you can see that the aryabhatiya of aryabhata uh it had uh, four chapters uh and you can see that the ganita pada is actually only one chapter and the geetika pada is again similar to the paribhasha in the leelavati okay the geetika pada discusses a scheme of representing number defines units of length states a number of necessary astronomical parameters it is in the ganita pada that various mathematical formulae are discussed and the later part of the text the palakriya pada and the gola pada you can see are entirely dealing with astronomy okay so in the palakriya pada it's computation of planetary positions eccentric and epicycle models uh, various calendrical elements in the gola pada you know the various aspects of the celestial sphere the rules of uh, various problems in spherical astronomy calculation and representation of eclipses so actually the spherical astronomy is also lot of mathematics basically but it is here specifically so, so the spherical trigonometry there is a lot of uh, interesting rules of spherical trigonometry which have been given which are mainly used in the computation of uh, uh, planetary positions etc but it this is mainly in the service of astronomy so you can see that uh, over 5 600 years a text goes from mathematics being one chapter or couple of chapters in an astronomical text to something like the leelavati which is entirely dedicated to mathematics so here you can clearly see that mathematics was coming into its own as a stand alone subject i'll now briefly talk about a few mathematical lineages so what do we mean by a mathematical lineage so mathematical lineage is basically uh, a succession of teachers and disciples okay the guru shishya parampara what we call in india the guru shishya parampara there have been many such lineages in india uh, various mathematical lineages have flourished in different parts of india at different periods of time Uh, frankly we have only partial information about the most important lineages and their contributions see let me tell you that uh, our our current understanding of the history of science in india and even the history of mathematics and astronomy in india is very limited uh, so scholars have estimated that just in mathematics and astronomy there are some 30000 manuscripts which are still available in various libraries as libraries across india out of which 
about only some 450 have actually been published and perhaps only 100 have been studied in detail okay so you can see 100 uh, out of some uh, 30000 manuscripts some of them may of course be you know copies of the same text but still we have only studied very very little so uh, so we are at only at the starting stages of understanding the history of science in india so it actually this should actually give you an idea of how you know it, we dropped off a cliff until couple of hundred years ago there was this entirely flourishing educational system and then in the last couple of years hundred of years it has completely dropped off a cliff and we are now almost completely clueless now as to what was uh, the the you know the knowledge system which was prevalent until then so now we are slowly starting to recover and reclaim some of that uh, so that's why we say i say that we have only partial information about the most important lineages and their contributions aryabhatta and brahmagupta were perhaps some of the two of the most important influential astronomer mathematicians the reason i state this is that though many of these lineages might not have been direct lineages of aryabhatta and brahmagupta but generally uh, the schools in india were uh, you know either they they were aryabhata schools or brahmagupta uh, brahmagupta schools they were called aryapaksha and Bra- brahmapaksha most of the schools either you know they revered aryabhata or brahmagupta and uh, from what we know so far it appears that maharashtra and kerala produced the most important mathematical lineages i will briefly talk about this maharashtra school and the kerala school uh, but just keep in mind that again uh, our understanding of this topic is uh, fairly limited and as more and more texts are studied and published uh, we will get a, a greater picture of better picture of uh, this schools mathematical schools of india so maharashtra seems to have had uh, a flourishing study of the mathematics there have been number of schools number of lineages which have been produced in uh, maharashtra particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries it, it seems to have flourished like anything in maharashtra perhaps the 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 most famous school of maharashtra is what is known as dadik grama school this dadik grama school has its origins uh near amravati near amravati and uh, the the initial scholars of the school were located near amravati maharashtra in vidarbha and uh, uh, so by the way what we call vidarbha today and what those scholars referred to as vidarbha that those definitions might have changed they refer to it as uh, vidarbha uh, so the subsequent scholars of this school appear to have migrated to kashi and so this this school flourished about 7 uh, 8 generations of this school we have information and the contributions of 7 8 generations of this school so this school flourished in the 16th and 17th centuries and perhaps the most important names okay i cannot uh, get into everyone here uh, uh, the the three most important names are krishna devagnya ranganatha and munishwara so krishna devagnya is uh, most well known for his bija pallava commentary on the bija ganita of bhaskaracharya uh, in this uh, so krishna devagnya gives lot of the details about his family lineage krishna devagnya's own brother was ranganatha and ranganatha is famous for writing what is known as the gudha prakasha commentary on the surya siddhanta and ranganatha's son was munishwara who has written this famous nisrushtartha duti commentary on bhaskara's leelavati munishwara also gives extensive details about his family lineage starting from uh, their location in dadik grama near amravati and their uh, and you know subsequently they came to kashi uh, so he gives extensive uh, details about uh, his family lineage and the contributions of his ancestors uh so this munishwara appears to have been the last major figure in this in this lineage uh 
so i cannot do justice to all the contributions of this lineage subsequently uh, i mean not subsequently uh, uh, contemporaneously with this there or even slightly prior to this there have been other important schools so there is what is known as the nandigrama school so nandigrama uh, is estimated to have been uh, scholars estimate uh, it is uh, it is supposed to be on the western coast of maharashtra uh, almost on the on the on it's it's, it's a suppose it appears to have been a coastal town coastal village and two important figures are keshav daivagnya and ganesha daivagnya keshav daivagnya is supposed to have done lot of uh, observational astronomy and ganesha daivagnya is uh, Uh, an important mathematician astronomer he has written what is known as the buddhi vilasini commentary on the lilavati of bhaskara acharya he has also written some other important texts such as graha laghava uh, important text on uh, astronomy uh, there is also what is known as the golagrama school uh, Nar- narasimha devagnya and kamalakara of the important figures this kamalakara and munishwara were uh, great rivals and they seem to have critiqued each other in their respective works in fact uh, on studying uh, nisrushtartha duti munishwaras nisrushtartha duti we get a clue about uh, exchange of academic ideas uh, you know you can say what in modern parlance is called peer review perhaps this was not uh, in that context but it appears that uh, you know uh, our scholars would uh, regularly read each other's works and then they would write their critiques of uh, the works of the other scholars in their own works and there was a very very vibrant exchange of ideas and criticisms and not just criticisms but even credit munishwara in his nisrushtartha duti for instance credits various proofs for different uh, mathematical relations to earlier scholars uh, so it's a, it's a, this, this this particular text is a treasure trove of uh, proofs and uh, details of some other mathematicians about whom now all all details are lost their works are lost but munishwara credits certain proofs to some lakshmi dasha ramachandra uh, other uh, mathematicians uh, so it's it, it gives an idea that it was this uh, ec- uh, you know the academy of the 16th and 17th centuries was a very vibrant in exchange of ideas criticisms proofs credit so as we would expect today you know the many of those concepts of what constitutes uh, good uh, academic practices are even we can find in munishwaras nisrushtartha particularly you know the the exchanges between munishwara and kamalakara and their criticisms are very interesting then there is what is known as the parthapura school gyana raja and surya dasa they have also written some important texts in mathematics and astronomy now we will come to what is known as the kerala school very very important school kerala has had a long history of the study of mathematics and astronomy with important names such as haridatta govinda swami uday divakara etc even before these in, uh, so these are all first millennia figures haridatta is 7th century uh, govind swami and uday divakara are couple of centuries later and even before these uh, uh, there was uh, this legendary figure known as vararuchi who was uh, supposed to have been what is known as chandravartyas and uh, it appears in the, in the in the second millennia around the 14th century uh, we see this figure known as madhava of sangamagrama so the sangamagrama has been identified as irinyalakuda uh, in kerala in this madhava was a legendary figure and he has authored a number of works such as venvaroha skuta chandrapri etc and later later scholars of the school attribute various path breaking results to madhava such as the infinite series for pi like the infinite series for the inverse tangent sine function etc and also number of astronomical innovations and it appears that uh, the, the 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 significance and the contribution of madhava madhava was so large uh, the succession of scholars actually continued and built upon the work of madhava for almost uh, you know you can say 3 centuries this continued 3 4 centuries this continued 
and many of the subsequent scholars have also uh, given many many important contributions so madhava student parmeshwara has authored about 30 works uh, he revised what is known as the parahita system of astronomy and introduced the trigganita system and he has observed eclipses for 55 years so parmeshwara son damodara and the latest disciple nilakanta continued the tradition Nilakanta wrote the seminal work Tantra Sangraha, among other work, among others. Jyeshtha Deva, a student of Damodara, wrote the celebrated Yukti Bhasha, Ganita Yukti Bhasha, okay, which gave an elaborate and systematic exposition of the rational of algorithms employed in Indian mathematics and astronomy. So, by far, uh, as far as we know today, among the works which have been studied today, this Ganita Yukti Bhasha is one of the most important works of uh, on proofs. In Indian mathematics, Shankara Warrior, a disciple of Nilakantha, wrote two commentaries on the Tantra Sangraha, the Kriya Karmakari commentary on the Leelavati. So you can see everywhere this Leelavati keeps popping up. It's, it's had great influence all over the country. And this Kriya Karmakari is an important commentary which again gives some very interesting proofs uh, on uh, for some, some of the relations given in the mathematical relations given in the Leelavati. This continuation, this tradition continued with Chitra Bhanu, Achyut Prisharati, etc. And this is the uh, very, very important and celebrated Kerala school of mathematics and astronomy. So, this is a somewhat of a fairly extended uh, introduction to the sources, texts, and schools. So, now we will come to the thinker's part uh, of the topic and uh, I would like to actually briefly pause here and see if there are any questions. Okay. I have uh, one small doubt that uh, one thing I have been noticing uh, that many times the tradition is passing from father to the son, but not that necessarily moving from one guru to a shishya. Uh, so was it happening that way or it is only an exception or something I am thinking on my own? And secondly, I want to know that what was the enabling factor at that moment that so many great insights were happening at that moment and after that in the modern India, uh, not so great progress is happening. So I want to understand what were those enabling factors at that moment which are missing now. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, could you just briefly introduce yourself? Sir, my name is Pankaj Gupta. I am currently professor and executive director with OP Jindal Global University and okay. I have been vice chancellor of two universities earlier and I am also a student of IKS. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question was, was this lineage, was this education only being passed from father to son? So let me put it this way, the education was certainly in those days, uh, I think uh, uh, in some instances at least passed from father to son, there is no doubt. But there was also a tradition that typically even if the father was learned, they would send their children to someone else to study typically. You know, this Gurukula system, you know, you need to leave home and go somewhere else. So there may have been some exceptions to this. But by and large, I would say that, uh, yes, this Dadigrama school appears to have been a... Uh, so, the Maharashtra lineages, the ones that I have mentioned here, tend uh, appear to have been more of this uh, family lineages. But the, the Kerala lineage is certainly not. In fact, we find only one instance of father and son in this lineage, which is Parmeshwara and Damodara. Parmeshwara was not Madhava's son. Nilakantha was not Damodara's son. Uh, so, only the, the only instance in the Kerala lineage of this being a father something appears to have been Parmeshwara and Damodara. But other than that, and there was no restriction. Let me tell you that there was no restriction on uh, other people coming. It's not like people taught only their own children. Uh, generally, if they were running a Gurukula, they would accept uh, students from, uh, uh, you know, uh, from all parts, not just their own children, otherwise it would not be sustainable. Uh, but yes, uh, but again, I would not 
want to give any definitive thing on this even on the maharashtra thing because we know very little we know very little about uh, other lineages which might have been prevalent and uh, uh, what was the practice there by the way even aryabhata so bhaskara one has written a commentary on aryabhata's uh, uh, aryabhatiya and uh, he comes almost uh, about 150 years after aryabhata uh, he appears to have been in the direct lineage of aryabhata bhaskara one but uh, uh, yes most certainly there is no evidence uh, nowhere it is stated that he is in the family lineage of aryabhata so there might be instances where the sons surpass their fathers but in many instances i think it is some other student who becomes the torch bearer of the guru rather than the son the second question if i understood it right was what was happening uh, around this in these periods that uh, there was this uh, flourishing of the study of science uh, and what is missing in subsequent Uh, modern india so this is a somewhat more difficult question to answer and perhaps uh, you know some sociologists can do a better job of this but i'll give you my thoughts i think for the flourishing of science you need a stable political uh, you need a stable political system and a flourishing economy these are the two prerequisites for the flourishing of education and academia in general in science in particular i think now it is uh, more evidence is coming forth that uh, for much of india for much of its history india had a fairly stable political and economic system and in fact india had one of the world's largest gdps for much of history and when both these were destabilized india's science scientific output also dropped in the past couple of centuries i think now as again the political system stabilizes post independence there has been lag obviously as india you know finds its feet and as the economy grows we can again see that uh, this is uh, the scientific output and uh, the study of science in india is again uh, uh, you know it's developing again it's going back to it's again advancing a fair bit and call me an optimist but i am fairly confident that it will further we will you know there will be progress in the study of science in india and we should be able to contribute significantly to the development of science going forward <laughs> hari good morning sir I am Dr. P. M. Srinivas, working as an associate professor at Central Sanskrit University. Uh, I want to add one point to the question of Dr. Pankaj Mishra ji, Pankaj Gupta ji. That yes. uh, is there any uh, father-son tradition in our Indian education? Yes, there was a father-son tradition, particularly the Vedas and Shastras are called as Shrutis. There was no written tradition, so. the father used to teach his children first and then shishya parampara so there was a, a saying that swadhya yodhetavya that rugveda yajurveda there are 21 shakas of rugveda shakala bashkala ashvalayana shankhayana so the father used to teach his children and grandchildren but uh, if the son is uh, uh, not wise or murkha or uh, something else says he is a mischievous person though the shastra will not be taught to a nayogya because he will misuse the shastra so that was the tradition there and secondly the before teaching any shastra the curiosity of the interest of the student is tested annam vidya tatha kanya anarthibhyo nadiyate iti so uh, just i add some few points no more no more questions i thought uh, in the previous session also we have heard the uh, uh, about jyotisha so jyotisha and ganita are flourished together i feel so uh, just i want to put a comment on this jyotisha and ganita flourished together yes 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 that's what i also mentioned that uh, mathematics and astronomy 
went hand in hand in india and most of the mathematicians were astronomers and vice versa thank you sir thank you so again we will only talk about few things and i will be leaving out some of the most important contributions such as uh, brahmagupta's chakravala algorithm for second order indeterminate equations the yukti bhasha derivation of the infinite series for pi all that i will not be dealing with here because uh, we cannot do justice to it in the limited time i will uh, i will just briefly highlight some of the other important uh, contributions okay so uh, i had mentioned that we find this powers of 10 listed in the vedic literature so this is in the taitriya samhita there is this mantra shataya swaha sahasraya swaha utaya swaha so on parardhaya swaha goes on till 10 power 12 uh in what context why it was stated this way all that uh, is a different discussion but uh, there is a clear uh, this powers of 10 can be clearly observed there is also this uh, i think many many of you may be familiar with this uh, chamaka prashna in the taitriya samhita which lists this odd numbers and multiples of four ekachame tisrashtame then chatusrashtame ashtavchame so this goes on ekachame tisrashtame it goes on from odd numbers from 1 to Uh, 33 and this multiples of 4 are listed from 4 to 48 and this in the purna madah purna midam uh, again a mantra which many of you might be familiar with uh, there is uh, this notion of infinity which we find it is of course a philosophical verse uh, so purna madah purna midam purna purna mudachyate so that is that is infinite this is infinite purna purna mudachyate so the the full or the complete or the infinite comes from the infinite purnasya purnam adaya purnam eva avashishyate when the purna is removed you know taken out from the purna the purna still remains so it's a very very interesting deep philosophical thing which also you know can uh, fit in uh, you know has some similarities to the mathematical notion of infinity there is uh, whenever in when i whenever i'm teaching this uh, Uh, this course mathematics in india at iit and i ask the students what do you know which indian mathematicians do you know what do you know about india's contribution to mathematics typically the first thing out of their lips is aryabhata and aryabhata either discovered or invented or whatever zero this is the first thing which i hear from many students so uh, this has given uh, you know you know it has had some positive impact in the sense that uh, students have developed some uh, interest and pride in the history of mathematics in india but this is strictly speaking uh, not accurate uh, in fact we find that notions of zero in uh, various contexts are found even before aryabhata in fact the first person to deal with the operations involving zero is actually brahmagupta and not aryabhata Uh, though certainly aryabhata must have been familiar and must have used zero because of the various computations he does are impossible uh, without that uh, but even before aryabhata for instance in pandi's ashtadhyayi you have this concept of lopa which functions as a null morpheme and in pingala's chanda sutra uh, you know the shunya is used as a marker uh, while describing an algorithm for evaluating positive integral powers of 2 So, rupe shonyam dush shonye. I will not get into all the details because each of these topics itself would be a full-fledged lecture. In the philosophical traditions, there are notions such as abhava in the Nyaya school, shonya vada in the Buddhas, uh, Buddha Buddhists. Uh, so there is the, there are various concepts of uh, zero. Uh, in fact, even the Bhakshali manuscript. Uh, you know the the first instance uh, or the first surviving text where we find this uh, uh, the use of a symbol for zero there is some controversy about its date uh, some people put it in the 7th century the bodleian library has dated certain folios of it to the you know 3rd century which would put it before aryabhata etc so uh, this is something which requires further research the use of zero very interestingly there are uh, uh, the, the 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 place value system has also been defined uh, 
you find it in the it in the unlikeliest of places so in the vasana vasha commentary on the yoga sutras of patanjali so you find this in a, in a, in a certain context yathaika rekha shatasthane shatam dashasthane dasha eka cha ekasthane eka rekha so just like the same line shatasthane shatam represents 100 in the 100th place dashasthane dasha okay it represents 10 in the 10th place ekacha ekasthane in the units place it represents 1 okay and then that analogy is used for some other discussion and similarly in the brahma brahma sutra bhashya of shankara also uh, some some analogy is used using the place value this place value system yatha ekopisan devadattaha loke swarupam sambandhi roopam so one person he says devadatta can be many things he can be a you know he can be a human he can be a man he can be a bala which is a, uh, you know a youth yuva uh, pita putra pautra okay he can be father son so many things one person can have so many identities and uh, again this place value comes ekapi sati rekha sthananyatvena by changing the one one line so the representing one sthananyatvena by changing its position you can to me ek dasha shat sahasradi it can represent so many things and so this again this is an analogy used for some philosophical discussion i won't get into that so there is very interesting discussions of the place value system these are not even mathematical texts uh, uh, i would just like to point out that to use the place value system as an analogy to explain some philosophical concept see generally you will use only those things as analogies which are very familiar okay which have uh, you know which are widely known you will not take some obscure or abstract concept which no one understands as as an analogy to explain something else so the fact that the place value system is being used as an analogy to explain something else actually shows that the place value system was very widely known in the society this is an interesting aside i want to show here so in the shulka sutras uh, so there is this clear statement of the what is in the indian tradition known as the bhuja koti karna nyaya okay so bhuja and koti are the base and the uh, upright and the karna is the hypotenuse so this is the basically the so called pythagorean theorem so this is found in the baudhayana shulka sutra dirgha chaturashrasya akshnaya rajju parshvamani tiryangmani chayat putak bhute kurutah tad ubhayam karoti so is basically saying that the the base and the uh, the latter and the vertical sides uh, do what the diagonal is doing in the manava shulka sutras there is a even more explicit statement aya ayamam ayamam gunam vistaram vistarenatu uh, so is they, they explicitly state that the square of the base and the square of the, the vertical give the square of the hypotenuse in the manava shulka sutra Uh, we are actually also even find uh, some implicit uh, proofs of how they may have arrived at this relation uh, in terms of uh, so there is this sutra which actually states how to compute or how to construct a square whose area is the sum of two squares okay so we have a b c d and i h c g so the procedure is you take the side of the smaller square mark it on the larger square and then you complete this rectangle af d e d okay and it is stated that the diagonal of this rectangle would be the side of the square whose area will be the sum of these two squares so you can see that in this square this ab abk and kih are actually outside the two original squares whereas ade and ehg are also left out from the original squares so it appears that uh, Uh, you know they had convinced themselves so they may not have given an explicit proof after all it was a manual okay it was not a text to be it was a manual for constructing altars so we can't expect proofs to be present in it but uh, the, the the way the constructions are being done it actually shows that they would have been uh, they would have convinced themselves of the validity of this place very interestingly we also find an approximation for root 2 in the shulka sutras so again bodhana shulka sutra is generally dated to about 800 bc uh, 
uh, based on some linguistic and uh, uh, other uh, no features but uh, it, the knowledge might have been older the knowledge in my opinion the knowledge might have been older because the shulba sutras are required for uh, uh, all vedic sacrifices and the vedic literature is dated earlier than this so we cannot say that for 1000 for 1000 years or more people were performing the vedic sacrifices without the knowledge of uh, these concepts so you can see that uh, uh, pramanam tritiyena vardhayet tacha chaturthena atma chatushkrimshonena savishesha so 1 plus 1/3 plus 1/12 minus 1 by 12 times 34 is the relation given for uh, the the diagonal of a square uh, so the way they would state it would be that this would be the diagonal of a square who with whose side is one so so there is some interesting way in which this might have been arrived at so you can take two squares you can cut up and place all the pieces like this and so then one small square will be left in the corner and then you can cut two strips on the left and the bottom of say width x okay so the their length will be 1 plus 1 3 plus 1 12 and so two times that and then because there will be an overlap here you subtract x square and you solve this quadratic by or you ignore x square and solve for x you get this relation this is how you may arrive at this so i will not spend too much time on this aryabhata has given very interesting methods of finding square roots and cube roots i will skip this as well uh ah bhaskara 1 has given uh, a very very interesting rational approximation to the sine function one of my favorite results uh, given by indian mathematicians so he states that sin theta can be equated to this rational approx 4 theta times 180 minus theta by 40500 minus theta times 180 minus theta okay so this is a very very interesting uh, uh, relation he gives uh, about computation of the sin function and uh, uh, in fact this is i have plotted the the, the sin function and uh, uh, bhaskara's relation on at the, Uh, in this scale you cannot see any difference uh, obviously if the scale is larger you can see the difference but you can see that it is symmetric about 90 and concave over the range 0 to 180 so this is a very very interesting and how they may have arrived at this is, is very unclear there are uh, some uh, ways in which uh, this has been explained by professor rc gupta has uh, suggested some ways in which this might have been uh, derived so this is the interesting madhava's infinite series for pi so uh, the hallmark of many of the sciences in india is this uh, versification okay very complex and challenging topics are presented in beautiful verse form so this is how madhava presents the infinite series for pi vyase varithi nihate roopa hrite vyasa sagara abhihate trisharaadi visham sankhya bhaktam runam swam prithak kramat kuryat so vyasa is the diameter okay vyasa is that which splits okay literally in that sense so veda vyasa is also the one who has split the veda so vyasa is the diameter because it will split the circle vyase varidhi nihate varidhi is ocean and in the bhuta sankhya system varidhi represents four so vyase varidhi nihate this diameter multiplied by four roopa hrite divided by 1 rupa is 1 divided by 1 vyasa sagara abhihate so vyasa sagara so again you have to multiply diameter by sagara which is again ocean which is 4 trisharaadi vishama sankhya bhaktam so 4d divided by vishama sankhya so that's odd numbers trisharaadi 3 is 3 shara in bhuta sankhya is arrow which is 5 So you have to divide by three, five, etc. Odd numbers. Runam swam prutha kramat kuriya. Runam swam means you have to sub subtract and add prutha kramat kuriya. In sequence, you have to subtract and add. So basically, he is stating that the circumference is nothing but four d by one minus four d by three plus four d by five, so on unto infinity. So if you bring this four d to the LHS, 
you will get 5 by 4 is 1 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 so on which uh, uh, was rediscovered in Europe about 3 centuries after Madhva and uh, uh, generally referred to as the Gregory Leibniz equation. So nowadays uh, uh, some of the scholars who are aware of Madhva's contribution have started calling this uh, Madhva series. And in the Ganitha Yukti Bhasha, there is a very, very interesting uh, geometric derivation of this, uh, this relation. It's, uh, it's quite fabulous. So I will uh, perhaps uh, very briefly uh, discuss a couple of, generally it's not well known that uh, Indian mathematical texts also give proofs in the commentaries. So I will just briefly show you one or two proofs which are available. Uh, uh, so Bhaskara in the Leelavati has given the summation relations. Okay, he uses uh, a, a meter, a poetic meter called Dodhakam. Okay, so it goes something like this: Saika padagna padardham theika tinka yute kela sankalita kya sadvi yute na pade na vidhi siyatri ruta kalu sankalita ikyam. Okay, so he's giving two relations in this. He's giving the, uh, you know, the, the sum, sum to n terms. And he is also giving what is known as the sum of sums. So, pada is a technical term they use. Pada to indicate the number of terms. Sai ka pada is pada plus sai ka pada. This pada plus one. So, n plus one literally. Sai ka pada gna, gna is generally used to indicate multiplication. Okay. Sai ka pada gna padartham. Padartha is half of the pada. N by two. So basically saying n by one n plus one times n by two atha ekadi anka yutihi. Okay, it is the sum of one etc numbers. Kila sankalitakya. It is known as sankalita. So the summation is known as sankalita in the Sanskrit uh, mathematical terminology. So, so basically stating that the sum to n terms is n by two times n plus one. Sa dvyutena padena vinigni. So, sa, sa means whatever you have obtained, dviyutena padena vinigni. So, this vinigni is again indicates multiplication. Whatever you have obtained, you have to multiply it by dviyuta pada. Dviyuta pada is n plus 2. Okay, pada is n. Dviyuta pada is n plus 2. Whatever you have obtained, you have to multiply by n plus 2. Trihuruta, you have to divide by 3. Kalu sankali taikyam. This is the sum of sums. So, n into n plus 1, this will be equivalent to n into n plus 1 into n plus 2 by 6. So you can see how interestingly he has given in this very rhythmic dodakam. So I just want to point out that even from a pedagogical point of view, uh, this is such a joy to study. Uh, I myself, so if I show you the next, next, next verse in the Lilavati, it gives the sum of squares and sum of cubes. Dvignapadam kuyu tamdrivi bhaktam sankalitenah tamkruti yogaha Sankalitasya krute samame ka tinka ganekya mudahrita matyai. Okay, again, dothakam. So he now gives the sum of squares. So dvigna padam kuyutam. Dvigna padam. Pada is n. Dvigna padam is 2n. Kuyutam. Ku represents is earth. And in Bhuta Sankhya it represents 1. So dvigna padam kuyutam is 2n plus 1. Trivi bhaktam divided by 3. Sankalitena hatam multiplied by the summation. So this n into n plus 1 by 2. So 2n plus 1 divided by 3, by 3 times the summation would be Kriti Yoga. Kriti is square, Kriti Yoga is sum of squares. n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6. And then he says that Sankalitasya Kriti is sum ekadi anka ghanaikyam. So the sum of cubes would be Sankalitasya Kriti is sum of So it would be the, simply the square of the summation. So it is n into n plus 1 by 2 whole square would be the sum of the cubes. So I just want to point out that from a pedagogical standpoint, see when I was in school, I used to always get confused in this formula. I myself in my personal experience, particularly the sum of the sum of sums and sum of squares are very similar formulae. This is n into n plus 1 into n plus 2 by 6. This is n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6. And while the students who are mathematically inclined 
may still you know have no difficulty in this many of the students who struggle with mathematics just by this this algebraic this representation the this this uh, in this notational representation itself i have noticed scares many students we lose them right there but imagine that i teach it this way ൂലിൽ you know you keep humming it in your mind and the meaning slowly reveals itself so this is a beautiful pedagogical technique which was in vogue almost till couple of 100 years ago and which we seem to have lost nowadays so uh, you know some certain experiments and certain reintroduction of such a, such a pedagogical techniques perhaps have to be uh, considered and so i will just quickly show you Uh, some of the proofs for instance neelakantha of the kerala school has given a geometric proof so he says how do i prove the sum to n terms is n into n plus 1 by 2 he says consider a figure like this okay so consider a square side 1 you know both sides are 1 then you consider rectangle base 2 height 1 base 3 height 1 so on the last term can be represented as a rectangle of base and height 1 okay this is called he calls it a shredi kshetra and now what you do is you construct another shredi kshetra and you put it in the reverse way and when you join them both you will get a figure whose area is n times but you only need the area of one figure so the sum to n terms is nothing but n into n plus 1 by 2 okay so this is a sort of a very very geometric visual visual way of giving a proof which will be uh, much more natural to the student uh, explaining the student uh see i would just like to point out that uh, this is how uh, this is a manuscript of munishwara nisrushta this is a snapshot of that Uh, just because they are doing this it doesn't mean that they are not familiar with algebraic notation actually even in prithudagas uh, commentaries on brahma skuta siddhanta so even more than 1000 years ago we find the use of algebraic notation in by indian mathematicians so you can see that you can see that there are some some terms like this these are all uh, this is all notational mathematics okay so you can see for instance you can see this expression per gha 1 Per bar three, per two six. Okay, so just just like we are using n as the variable here, they are using per as the variable here. Okay, so per is pada. So whatever we are using as n, they are using as per. And per gha is nothing but pada ghana, pada ghana. So that is n cube, and one is the coefficient. So basically, this first term is one n cube. Okay. so this is uh, so this will be uh, sum of squares or sum of sums so n cube six okay so so this is the sum of sums he is stating it this way so 1 n cube per wise pada varga so that is n square and the coefficient is 3 so it is 1 n cube plus 3 n square per 2 is 2 n and the 6 you can see is put in the bottom it's the denominator just like we do today for a fraction only thing they don't do is they don't put the line in between they just put it below so this is basically this expression is n cube plus 3n square plus 2n by 6 this is how it is being stated so algebraic notation i just wanted to point out here is not uh, not some european innovation it was very much being used in india from at least 1000 years ago so in fact uh, we don't have time to get into all this but uh, uh, so for instance to find the sum of sums 
Munishwara gives a very, very interesting proof. Okay, so I want to know what is the sum of sums. So you have these series, right? This is the first row is sum to one term. The second row is sum to two terms. The third row is sum to three terms. And the last row is sum to n terms. So I want to know what is the sum of sums. So I basically want to know the sum of all these sums. So Munishwara states the proof this way. He says, you add them column wise. Okay, this is what Munishwara states. Okay, so you will type, you will get n times 1 plus n minus 1 times 2 plus n minus 2 times 3. So on till n minus n minus 1 times n. And then he, he goes into a very detailed algebraic, uh, uh, you know, he does lot of, uh, uh, you know, manipulations. And so he takes, take this n common out. So it will become n times 1 plus 2 plus n. And then you, you know, the, all the other terms you combine, it will be 1 times 2 plus 2 times 3 plus 3 times 4, so on. And then he does a lot of manipulations. And then he arrives, he shows in a purely algebraic fashion also, he shows the, uh, the entire derivation. In fact, whatever you are seeing here, there will be entire pages full of algebraic notation, full of this algebraic, uh, uh, you know, step by step manipulation until you arrive at the result. So, perhaps I will conclude with a uh, couple of examples from the Leelavati, which uh, again, uh, you know, highlight this pedagogical act aspect of. Uh, uh, mathematics education in India. So the Leelavati is a beautiful text. Bhaskara uses variety of poetic meters. In fact, uh, it's not just a great mathematical text, but it is also a great poetic text. And one of the other hallmarks of this text is some very beautiful examples, which uh, you know will really grab the attention of the student. Uh, so he gives the, you know, for instance, the root to the quadratic equation. We don't have time. I will not get into this. But I will just give you the quadratic equations are some of the most beautiful problems in the Leelavati. So let's look at this uh, example. Okay. Yatam hamsakulasya mula dashakam meghagam e manasam praudhi yasthala padmini vanamagat ashtam shakom bhastatat bale balam runala shali nijale Okay, so this is in a poetic meter called Shardula And uh, so we have to basically determine the number of swans. There are, you know, this, this group of swans, a herd of swans. And you need to determine how many are there. Okay. Yatam megha game manasam yatam. So it appears that as the rains are approaching, the swans, the group, from the, from the group of swans, one part is migrating to Manasa, Manasarovar Lake. Okay. Yatam hamsa tulasya mula dashakam. Mula dashakam is 10 times the square root. So, upon the arrival of the monsoons, 10 times the square root has migrated to Manasarovar Lake. Praudhiya sthalapadmini vanam. Okay. One eight ashtam chaka. Ashtam chaka has flown to what is known as the sthalapadmini forest. Okay. Bale, Balam Runala Shalini Jale, Elikriala Lasam, Drishtam, Hamsa Yugatrayam. Three pairs. You know, everyone else has gone, but these are still some laggard swans. They are still in the water. Okay. So three pairs. That means six are still remaining. Yuthasya Sankhyam Vadha. Tell me how many are there. Okay. So, so basically, they take the unknown as X square. Okay, so if the unknown is x square, it will be x square by 8 plus 10x plus 6. So you have to solve this quadratic and uh, get the solution. So you can see how beautiful the example is bringing in some uh, uh, thing from uh, another example from the Mahabharata, you know, the war between Arjuna and Karna and the battle between Arjuna and Karna, and we have to determine how many arrows Arjuna had. Okay, so Partha used half his arrows to counter Karna's arrows. So four times the square root he used to 
for the horses of karna shalyam shadbi he used six to immobilize shalya the sarathi of karna and with three arrows he chatram dhwajam kar mukam okay he cut the umbrella flag and the bow of karna chichedasya shirasharena with a single arrow he uh, slayed karna and so tell how many arrows did arjuna have so you can see there are many more beautiful examples there has been a from the vedic period to modern times india has maintained a long and continuous mathematical tradition okay during this period numerous mathematicians and astronomers of repute have produced a large corpus of mathematical literature aryabhata brahmagupta bhaskara etc have made many important contributions to the study of madhava also i should include <laughs> Uh, many important contributions to the study of mathematics and astronomy it appears that particularly in the 16th and 17th centuries maharashtra produced a number of important lineages which took forward the study of astronomy and mathematics similarly the kerala school founded by the illustrious madhava founded by the illustrious madhava sangamagrama made major discoveries in calculus mathematical analysis etc indian mathematical texts do not abound merely in theorems but also in detailed proofs and the indian mathematicians tended to root the subject matter in familiar culture and language which greatly aided the learning process and then lastly i should have put that point that this poetic mode of instruction was a fabulous way of taking mathematics to a wider uh, you know perhaps taking away the fear factor from mathematics among the students so that's another major hallmark of the indian mathematical tradition So with that, I will conclude my thought talk. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. I am Dr. Banasri Sharkar from Assam. Uh, sir, uh, one question: You uh, have mentioned only Maharashtra and Kerala. Why not others, sir? Can't hear you. I am sorry. sir you have mentioned only maharashtra and kerala produce the most important mathematical lineages why not others sir this is my queries why not agastya maharashtra and uh, kerala you have mentioned why not other parts sir actually not uh, assam <laughs> i'm sorry i didn't uh, understand the question i didn't understand the question is there any other school of mathematics other than kerala and maharashtra no no see i already put a i put a disclaimer that uh, we have uh, we have very limited information currently currently these are some of the schools that we know if i have missed anything i'm sorry uh, but i think there are there are some i have not put actually i mean of course i mean that itself would be a entirely very long discussion uh, there are some other there is some jambu sagar nagara and uh, some other but in kerala this is the major school and in maharashtra i think i have covered the major schools uh, but in other parts of india more much more research has to be done we don't know we don't know okay like i said very few of the texts have still been studied so only through after more research we need more scholars from all parts of india Uh, you know to look into these texts uh, only then we can uh, develop a better understanding sir your talk was very good uh, aditya ji thank you and uh, i just have one small observation uh, yes. you mentioned ki wo jo hans the wo wahan gaye and uh, that was presented beautifully in the form of a uh, poetry uh and, yes. that, and that was a non threatening way uh mujhe to ye bada threatening way lag raha hai because if uh, i am somebody or maybe jo bacche hain aaj ki main dekhta hu if uh, they have to understand sanskrit and uh, so don't you think that uh, some in the current context we need to uh, find what will really work and which will create interest in among, among uh, our kids No, no. See, first of all, the students who have been studying mathematics yeah. in those days would have known Sanskrit. Okay, so the language would not have been a barrier for them. Yeah. In today's context, I agree that uh, many people don't know Sanskrit. So there are two options. One, let us uh, you know reintroduce Sanskrit for everyone, or two, 
if that is too difficult or politically infeasible or other uh, let us uh, you know uh, it can be taught uh, in in indian languages or even in english okay it just needs someone uh, mathematicians to be more imaginative and innovative and creative and not uh, stick to this uh, uh, sort of uh, european way of uh, teaching mathematics okay there are there are there are advantages i don't want to critique it uh, just simply like that there are advantages to the way it's it's being taught currently also but at least at the primary level when mathematics is being introduced i think uh, in a versify in a uh, in a poetic fashion in their own mother tongues uh, uh, you know would be perhaps the best way if if it if it cannot be done in sanskrit sir ek chhota sa prashn aur tha ki jaise us mein kya hota hai ki bachchon ko shuru se sikha dete hain you calculate by using a calculator do you think it is a hmm. good, good way of teaching ya unki jo atmik vikas hai जो हम लोग पहाड़े सिखाते थे एंड टेबल्स एंड ऑल हम लोग का वो सिस्टम रहा है तो इन दिस मेथड एंड आल्सो टेलिंग देम हाउ टू यूज द कैलसी सो कैन यू प्लीज मेक सम कमेंट ऑन दैट सर थैंक यू सी आई थिंक दैट इफ यू इफ यू वांट टू बी अ गुड मैथमेटिशियन गुड साइंटिस्ट यू नीड टू हैव कंफर्ट विद नंबर्स आई थिंक फॉर पीपल हु वॉन्ट टू यू नो Uh, who will drop mathematics perhaps uh, you know calculator is not such a bad option i don't know uh, many people get away with rudimentary i mean you know not everyone needs high level mathematics to get on with their lives uh, but uh, i think at least at the young age uh, at least the basics should be done without calculator only at a later stage i think uh, we should introduce uh, calculators in my opinion <laughs> uh, i'm finding that even at iit students nowadays are having difficulty because earlier je didn't allow all these uh, calculators we had to use log tables and what not now it is even je is allowing calculators and i'm finding that even uh, iit students are somewhat struggling with uh, uh, you know if 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 in, if I, if in any of my exams i say a calculator is not allowed then there are a lot of murmurs and grumbling and uh, they do struggle to do so i generally it's a bad idea particularly if people are aiming for a science or mathematics or engineering uh, careers certainly i think calculator should be discouraged to unka kehna hai jaise ek hamara alankar hota hai jaise kanak kanakte sokuni madakta adhikaye to Uh, like same word is uh, having different meaning the same Kare. way you explained the uh, shloka in one way it can be having other meanings also like po oh, no that okay so see this is not a problem okay so this this is something which happens even today okay in scientific terminology the same word which in uh, general usage will have something will definitely have a different meaning even today when in english that will be true this is nothing to do with sanskrit only and uh, so it is just that that's why all the text start with paribhasha i told you know so uh, that is where you figure out the mathematical terminology and typically ideally see ideally you are supposed to study it from a teacher who will be able to explain these things to you Uh, but even otherwise uh, nowadays there are lot of mathematical uh, glossaries of technical terms which have been uh, produced by scholars working in the history of indian mathematics that will help you in interpreting the verses 